Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Covenant Baptist Church. Um, we're glad that you're joining us from whatever means you're joining us, wherever you're at. I wanted to start worship off this morning with um, a, a few excerpts from the book that I'm, one of the 17 books that I'm reading right now, Worship Matters by Bob Coughlin. And it just, I thought it was really profound how he was talking about why we sing and why we sing as a congregation. So um, bear with me as I read through this. The emotions that singing is meant to evoke are a response to who God is and what he's done. Vibrant singing enables us to combine truth about God seamlessly with passion for God. Music helps us reflect the glory and activity of the triune God. It's a source of profound encouragement to realize that God gave us music to deepen and develop our relationship with him. Music helps us remember truth about God. We remember what we sing, and nothing is more important to remember than God's word. Music-produced feelings will fade, but God's living and active word will continue working in our hearts renewing our minds, and strengthening our faith. So let's remember that as we are worshiping our King this morning. Yeah. 
Jeremiah 17, 7 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green, and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Let's sing together, Sovereign Over Us. Is 
strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in our mourning with a love that casts out fear. You are working in our waiting, sanctifying us. You're teaching us to trust Your plans are still to prosper You have not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the flood You are faithful forever You're perfect in love You are sovereign Good morning again. I'm Michael Duenas and I'm an elder here at Covenant Baptist Church and we're continuing to look at the book of Ephesians. We're now on chapter 4 and if you haven't been with us for the previous uh, sermons you can find them at our website and so the first I think I've done four so far those are over there. We also had one of our elders Sam Feather did a series on Philippians before this so uh, any of our sermons are over there on our website, and you can find those, and we'd encourage you to listen to those, and particularly if you haven't been uh, tracking with this series to hear the messages before this one, uh, because they all kind of build on each other, uh, you can go over there and encourage you to do that. Let me pray before I get into it here, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we know this is your word, your infallible, inerrant, inspired word, under whose authority we stand. And so we offer this time up to you. We pray that you bless those who hear and that you would bring us to full maturity in Christ. It's in his name we pray, amen. 
Uh, Before I get to Ephesians 4, I do want to read some words of Jesus himself, because I think they're important to give the backdrop. The first three chapters of Ephesians have been mostly doctrinal teaching, mostly talking about what God has done for us in Christ, and really almost nothing by way of moral or ethical command. And based on that now, these last three chapters of Ephesians is where we get into the, the real meat and bones of how we are to live in light of what God has done for us. And so I wanted to read these words from Christ. He says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. So one of the things I want to focus on as we go into these last three chapters in Ephesians really is what is it that the Apostle Paul is telling us to do, what does God want us to do, but also how can we do it? How can we act on it? Like Jesus says, we don't want to just hear it and ignore it because then we'll be like foolish people who built their house on sand and our fall will be great. So by way of background again, let's just go through some of the things that God has done for those who trust in Christ. It tells us In Ephesians 1, that God has chosen us. If you're a believer in Christ, God chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. He chose you so that you would be holy and blameless before him. That was his goal in choosing you. He predestined you and has adopted you into his family. So you are a member of God's family as a a daughter or son of the king. And we have redemption through the blood of Christ, the forgiveness of our sins, he talks about. He also talks about that we've been sealed for the day of redemption with the Holy Spirit. So we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, and uh, he is the down payment of our final redemption. So we have that happening also. In chapter 2, Paul told us that even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God made us alive together with Christ. So if you are a believer in Christ this morning, that's also because God made you a believer. He has, by his sovereign grace, caused you to live spiritually. Not only that, but it says that he has raised us with Christ and he seated us with him in the heavenly places. And really the banner over all of this is the verses that you know well, that by grace we have been saved through faith. And this is not something we've done for ourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, So there's no ground for boasting. And it tells us that God has created us in Christ Jesus for good works. And indeed, God has prepared these good works ahead of time for us to act on them, to walk in them, to practice them. And so we want to do that. And he's also said that both Jew and Gentile are now one in Christ. That all of those who are in Christ have the full blessings of the gospel the full blessings of Christ's death and resurrection on our behalf. And so that is the foundation. And that's what we have to keep in mind because as we get into these commands, we want to make sure that we're not not moralists here as Christians. We're not just trying to clean ourselves up. As I said last week, we weren't bad people who needed a little bit of cleaning up, but we're dead people who needed new life. And that's what God has done for us in Christ. He's given us new life through the new birth in Christ. And that's so important because that foundation, our life in Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit is how we will obey these things that we are going to be commanded here in these later verses. So we always want to remember that. And I'll come back to that theme again and again. So let's start in chapter 4. And we'll read the first six verses here. Paul says, Therefore, the prisoner, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling 
with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So we can see here the theme of unity. But if you look at verse 1, Paul says, in light of the fact that God wants to fill us with all the fullness of Christ, he, wants, he, he is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, therefore we ought to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And just to think about this a, a bit, let's say that you were appointed by the president to be an ambassador to a foreign country. You would certainly consider this to be an important position and something where there, there's honor involved. There's a need for integrity and honesty in a way, a, a need to carry yourself and to comport with uh, dictates of doing things that are right and acting a certain way. You wouldn't want to be caught doing things that are foolish or living in a way that would bring ill repute on the United States. After all, you would be an ambassador, right? And so you would think to yourself, this is a worthy calling I have to be an ambassador. I want to live and act in a way, even when I'm not on duty, so to speak, even when I'm not at my job. As I carry myself day to day, I want to act in a way that's going to show that I'm worthy of this post that I have, worthy of representing the United States before a foreign country. I have this task as a lawyer, as an attorney, uh, I have an ethical duty and a, and a calling, really, to live in honesty and integrity and uprightness, not just uh, when I'm at my job. Indeed, I can be disciplined as an attorney if I'm dishonest in ways that have nothing to do with being an attorney. If I cheat on my income taxes, uh, I'm going to be in trouble and probably will have my law license taken away. So there's a worthiness. How much more then, we who have now been called into the kingdom of God, we are now sons and daughters of God Most High. We are fellow heirs with Christ, inheritors of all the blessings of the gospel. How much more ought we to live in a way that's worthy of that life? We're not trying, Paul's not saying live in a way to make yourself worthy. No, we're already in. We're in his kingdom. So now we want to live in a way that is consistent with that. And that's what he's saying here. And so it's something just to pay attention to, to have that mindset each day to say, I want to live in a way that's worthy of God most high and all my actions and my words and the things that I do and my priorities. And he says the way to do this is by humility and gentleness with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So the way that we pursue a worthy walk before Christ is in humility, considering others better and more important than ourselves, as Paul says in Philippians. And being diligent, very diligent. That means we don't just think about it here and there. We want to be diligent and zealous to preserve unity. And Paul, this is one of the, the greatest statements of unity in the New Testament here, where he says, look, we're one body. There's one spirit. There's one calling. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. We are part of something the world over, and there's just one church. There's one body of Christ. We are members one of another. And so we want to strive to be unified. And this isn't a unity that's just an outward kind of unity. No, it's a unity that should be based on truth and on righteousness and on living in the way that Jesus commands us to live. And so um, we want to be mindful of that too, uh, ever seeking to be unified with our brothers and sisters uh, according to the truth. And Paul will return to that theme. So I, I'm not going to say a lot about that other than that that's something that we can explore that in great depth. But that is, should be our aim and goal as brothers and sisters here and across other churches and other uh, peoples that we know uh, who are believers in Christ to want to have that unity insofar as we can, to remember that there really only is one Lord and one gospel. Now we go to verses 7 
and we'll read verses 7 through, uh, well, we'll just read the 7 through 16 here. We'll read that longer section. Paul says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature person, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Again, there's a lot here, and I'm not going to cover all of it this morning. This is something that's worthy of meditating on and thinking about, but I just want to hit some high points and make some observations here. As we probably all know, God, in verse 7, it says, has given each of us gifts. He says, each of us, by grace, was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So we have gifts that God has given us. Uh, It says that in verse 8. When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives. He gave gifts to men. So every one of you has a spiritual gift that God has given and perhaps more than one, that he wants you to use. He wants you to to live out of it and to understand what it is. Paul doesn't talk about that really here. 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 12 through 14 talk a lot about the spiritual gifts and what they are and how we're to exercise those, and I'd encourage you to, to look at those verses. But just to know that you have a spiritual gift if you are a follower of Christ, and God has given it to you for the purpose of building up your brothers and sisters in Christ, for building up the body, the church, so that we come to be mature in Christ. This is the great aim. Again, in Romans 8, Paul said that Christ chose us and foreknows us um, so that he's predestined us to be conformed to the image of Christ, to become like Christ in our character and our living. That's the great aim of our salvation, to be like Jesus. And so we have these gifts in order to help one another along that path. And then Paul gets down to these specifics. In verses 10, in verse 10 he says he descended, well actually in verses 9 and 10 he talks about he ascended and descended, and there's some controversy over these verses. There's different interpretations of what does it mean that he descended to lower parts of the earth. I'll just say that in the big picture, I think Paul is saying that the reach of Christ's authority is... As he says in Philippians, it's in the heavens above and in the earth below and under the earth. Whatever that expression means. I mean, it's just total. Christ has been raised and exalted to the right hand of God, and his authority is total. It's everywhere. And it says in verse 11 that he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. That's not the whole range of all the spiritual gifts, but these five here in particular are ones that Paul hones in on because those particular offices or those particular people, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, they are to use those gifts in particular to equip believers for the work of service. So part of my job here as a teacher is to equip you to take your gifts and to use those gifts in the building up of the body of Christ, to serve the body of Christ, to minister, like he says, for the work of service, verse 12, to the building up of the body of Christ. And that's why we have these gifts. That should be our aim. And we'll come back to this in verse 29 when Paul talks about how we ought to use our words. It's the same purpose, to build people up in the Lord. Okay, so those are the, those are the gifts that he's given 
in order to do that work of equipping you to serve and to build up the body of Christ. And why are we doing this? Because in verse 13 he says we want to attain to the unity of the faith. Again, where there's not all these divisions. I know sometimes people think, well, we have all these different denominations and maybe outsiders look at this and say, gosh, these Christians, they can't get together on it. They have, you know, divide up over baptism. They divide up over the Lord's Supper. They divide up over the authority of, of the Pope. And, you know, we got all these divisions. We got the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. What, what does this talk about the unity of the faith? But Paul's already talked about that. Ultimately, there is just one faith. Right now, we may see in some ways, as Paul says, dimly, as a, you know, uh, we don't see the full picture, and we have maybe some divisions in ways that we ought not to have, but we want to be moving toward, and our goal is to have this unity, attaining the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, right? For, Peter says in one of his epistles, grow in the grace and knowledge of God, knowing God. When Jesus says in the Gospels, one of the, one of the problems, one of the judgments that will come at the day of judgment is that he will say to people, away from me, I never knew you. We, we, don't, we won't know him. We won't have a relationship with him. And that's what Paul says the work of ministry is here, to help us attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to become mature in the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Becoming more like Christ. As Dallas Willard says, our goal as disciples is to be with Christ so that we might become like him. To be with Jesus to become like him. That's really all Paul is saying here. Verse 14, as a result, we are no longer to be children. Right? The aim of ministry is so that we won't be like little children. Children, they don't know a lot of things. They might believe one thing one day. They might think the moon is made of green cheese and then another day, you know, or they think Santa Claus is real, but then somebody says he's not real and they don't know what to think. They're little children, right? They, they're tossed around in different beliefs. We don't want to be like that, he says. No, we don't want to be like children any longer, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. And those people have always been around. If you read the New Testament, it's clear there are false teachers. Paul addresses false teaching at many points in his letters. They were there then, they're there now. False teaching abounds. There are lots of uh, doctrines and things that, that we can get you know, buffeted about by and, and say, well, what, what am I supposed to think about this? Paul says... We don't want to be like that, and that's the work of the ministry. That's the work of teaching. That's the work that the pastors and the shepherds and others should be doing is to help us come to a knowledge of the truth so that we aren't pushed back and forth. We aren't in this confusion of what should I think? What should I think about Christ? What should I think about his death and resurrection? What should I think about faith and, what, and salvation and, and, how, and good works and all those kinds of things? We want to... Come to a knowledge of the truth. And therefore, verse 15, he says, the way to do that is to speak the truth in love. That's part of our task as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why it's, it's difficult in these days when we have this coronavirus and we haven't been able to get together because to speak the truth in love, you have to speak to people. You have to be with them. You have to talk to them. I mean, obviously you can write them emails and send them notes and there's a lot of ways to communicate. But the point is, there has to be communication of the truth in love to each other so that we are growing in our understanding of the truth and the knowledge of Christ so that we're not set adrift by confusion and believing false things. So this is something you ought to think about practicing. And he's not just saying, hey, speak the truth about the weather out there or speak the truth about, you know, Oh, wasn't that movie great? Or I mean, it's, in other words, we're not, we're not talking about just basic kind of you know, mundane truth here, although that may be a part of it. The truth he's talking about is the truth that we're, we have learned about the gospel. So the things, like I said, that we have heard in the first three chapters of Ephesians, the fact that God chose us, the fact that we've been redeemed by the blood of Christ, the fact that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The fact that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Whatever these things are, 
that's the truth that we want to be reminding each other of. We want to remind ourselves and speak the truth to others. Yeah, that's the, we don't often do that. It, sometimes I think it feels a little hokey to us. Like, should I really be pressing these truths of the gospel on people? But yes, we ought to. We must. So that we're not carried about by every wind of doctrine and trickery of men and craftiness and deceitful scheming. It's very important. Verse 16, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Your part in the church is very important. No one can ever say, oh, I don't have any role here. I'm just, I, I don't really do much. I'm kind of come here. Now, yeah, obviously, if you just come here on a Sunday and sit here and passively take things in and then leave, you are not walking in a manner worthy of the calling that God has called you with. You're not trusting him as you ought. You're not participating in the full blessings of being a son or a daughter in Christ. Okay? The, the church was never meant to be just a gathering on Sundays. We are a people. Like he says, Paul talked about, he used the, the metaphor of a building before. We're a building. We're a dwelling place for God. We're not like a sack of marbles, just kind of loosely associated individuals. No, we're one church, one body. And we have to encourage each other and build each other up by speaking the truth to each other. Now we get down to these very practical exhortations and commands. So I'll read verses 17 to the end. Paul says, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you didn't learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. There's that thought again. Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for building up according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Now it bears repeating. This is not just some kind of ethical treatise. This is not... Thomas Jefferson saying, let's get rid of all the supernatural parts of the Bible and the miracles, and let's just boil it down to these ethical commands and try to live this way. We're not saying, hey, this is really a great way to live, and who cares about God and Jesus? We don't need that. Let's just take these ethical things, and let's become, try to become good people who have clean mouths and all that. No. You can be a clean person who never says the F word and never uh, outwardly does anything and be going straight to hell. And we know this because the Pharisees were those people. You can be sure that the Pharisees did not use foul, the foul language of their day. They were very shiny people. They looked good on the outside. Jesus said that, made it clear, right? You're whitewashed tombs. You look great. You appear very clean and moral to men. But inside are dead men's bones. You're dead. You're sons of hell. You do the will of your father, the devil. So let us be sober about this and take care that we not just say, let's just turn over a new leaf and try to obey these things and clean ourselves up so that we can be like this. No. No, we must, by faith, by God's grace, put to death the old man, like 
Paul says in Romans 6, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. In Colossians 1, he says, you've already died. Your old self is already dead. Your new self, you're, you're living as a new self. And Paul says here, we have to do it again, right? We constantly have to be laying aside, verse 22, the old self, which is being corrupted. But we have to be putting on the new self. That is how we will obey these things, uh, theologically. I mean, there's some practical things we need to do also, and I'll talk about those a little bit. But he said, I don't, you, you, know, you Gentiles, you are now, you've now been included in the, the fullness of the body of Christ, and you don't want to walk the way you used to walk, the way the world walks. That's really how Paul's using this term Gentiles here. Gentiles means the unbelieving world. And we could go into great detail here, but this is kind of a parade of horribles like we've seen in Romans 1 and other places. Apart from Christ, people are ignorant. They're darkened. Their thinking is futile. I don't care how much knowledge they have. They're not a ever able to arrive at the full understanding of the nature of things and the truth about things because their hearts are hard. They're callous. They give themselves over to sensuality, sexual immorality, greed, impurity. That's the direction of that we were going and that everyone is going apart from Christ. But he's saying that's, that's not who you are anymore. Now you are a different person in Christ. And so the aim here is to, as John Piper says, to become what you are. To become what you are. Okay, the sea that we swim in is full of things like falsehood, anger, taking from others, rotten speech, callousness. That's the, the ocean in which we swim and we want to be different people in christ okay so let's just take these kind of in order here starting in verse 25 he says therefore laying aside falsehood speak truth each one of you to his neighbor why because we're members one of another and i've talked about this we are brothers and sisters in christ we need to encourage each other in the truth we need to put aside falsehood and again we could talk about this at great length all throughout the Bible, from beginning to end, it is clear God hates lies. The devil is called the father of lies. We know in Proverbs 6, one of the things that God hates, it says, is a lying tongue. Okay? Falsehood has to be put away from us. And, and this really goes deep. Again, it's worthy of meditating on, it, it could be a sermon in itself, what it means to put away falsehood and what are the falsehoods that we are, that we believe, and that we're involved in, okay, falsehoods in our own heart, falsehoods that we tell other people, okay, it's often more than we think, falsehood isn't just bald-faced lying, falsehood is often portraying ourselves in a certain way, or even, like, say, my job, if I say that I'm doing my job, but I'm not really doing it, or I'm lollygagging, or I'm, I'm just kind of giving a half effort, I'm being false, my employer thinks I'm doing something I'm not really doing, right? I'm, I'm living in falsehood, okay? If I'm not loving my wife or children the way I should, I mean, I'm, and I, but I portray myself as I am, I'm, I'm being false. It's a very serious thing. He says, in fact, I... I I, I didn't have this, so I don't have this in my notes, but I do want to just press the point home here while we're at it. Revelation 21, you don't have to turn there, I'm going to read this to you. It's, it's a sobering verse. Revelation 21, verses 7 and 8. It says, he who overcomes will inherit these things, will inherit the tree of life, will inherit the gift of eternal life. He says, you'll inherit those things if you overcome, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But, verse 8, for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So falsehood is a serious thing, and that's why we have to speak truth, each one of us, with his neighbor. Okay, we have to be uh, doing that because we're members of one another. We are the body of Christ. We are 
people who are the truth. We live by the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth by Jesus. So that's important. We ought to work on that. Verse, verse 26, verses 26 and 27, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Now, again, much could be said here about whether we should be anger, angry and righteous anger. I think all I want to say about it is, and all the commentators, I think, agree with this, and I think our own experience confirms it. Anger is, in us, is typically not righteous anger. When we're angry, this is not of the righteous kind. Okay, the righteous kind is like Jesus when he was going to heal the man with the withered hand, he had the, there's a withered man in the synagogue, and the Pharisees and the religious leaders are there, and Jesus asks whether it's right to heal this man, and they, they're silent. They can't say, yeah, of course you ought to heal the man. They're, they have nothing to say. And it says, Jesus, grieve, he, in grief, he looked at them. He was angry at them. That's righteous anger. We almost never have that. And in fact, in the book of James, it says, man's anger does not accomplish God's righteous purpose. So anger is not something that we want to be trafficking in. It's not something we want to have. So even when he says here, be angry, I think really the emphasis would be if there is a situation where you are, where, where there is anger, or there's some kind of justifiable anger, you ought to be very careful with that. And it ought not to last very long at all. That's what don't let the sun go down in your anger means. It, it ought to be short-lived if it is even righteous, which it typically isn't. Okay, and we don't want to, I mean, and I think he presses that home later on when he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander, I mean, that's all got to be put away from us. Because all that gives place to the devil to have a way to work. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that, you know, I, you've heard that it was said, don't murder, but I tell you, don't be angry with your brother. Because the root of anger and the root of murder is the same root. It's the same sinful root. And the devil will take advantage of it if we let him. So we want to put away from us anger. And if we have any kind of righteous anger, it should be very short-lived. Okay, verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good. Now, if we just stop there, we'd say, okay, well, that's true. I mean, obviously, if you're stealing, you ought not to steal anymore, and you should do something else. I think Paul here is talking about people in his day, probably who uh, were poorer folks and tempted to steal because they didn't have a, a, a gainful way of getting money and getting their needs met. And so he says, don't steal anymore. Find work to do with your hands. But it could apply to all of us. We ought not to steal. And again, stealing is not just mean I went into the, the liquor store and I took a Mars bar. Okay, that's, that's not... Stealing could be me stealing from my employer. Again, saying I'm giving him work that I'm not really giving him. I, I'm, I'm going to work eight hours, but I really only work seven because I spent an hour of it just chewing the fat with the you know, guy down the hall. That's stealing. Okay, stealing comes in many forms. He says, don't do that. Work hard. Work with your hands. Work. Do what is good. But Why? Why ought we to work to get our money? Why do we need to work to get our money? Is it so that we can have it, so we can do the things that we want to do and go on vacations and uh, you know, have a cool TV and a computer? That's not what he says here. He says you ought to work, you ought to labor with your own hands so that you will have something to share with one who has a need. That's the ultimate purpose of our getting money. Of course we need to meet our own needs. Paul's certainly not saying, hey, give until you have needs so that you know, somebody has to give to you. No, that, that, that would be you know, ludicrous. Of course we ought to provide for our needs. And he says that we ought to have something so that we can give to others who have need. So the aim and purpose of working to get money is not primarily so that we can store up and hoard up things for ourselves. That's greed. That's what he said, right? That's the way the world is going. They're given over to greediness, he says in verse 19. No, we want to labor and work so that we have needs for ourselves met and we can also meet the needs of others. And that is where the real joy comes in working and laboring to make money. Again, more could be said, but now we get to verse 29. I think this one, you know, this come home, comes home to me all the time, not just 
because of my own mouth, but I have children too, so I, there, there's a constant trying to instruct them in what, how they ought to speak to each other and to others. And I, I just would pause here and say, think about what comes out of your mouth. Think about how you use your mouth. I mean, I, when I think about how I use my mouth, I, I think there are a lot of things that come out of it that really ought not to. And the word here, this, my translation says, let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth. Uh, there are different translations. Some say, let no corrupt word uh, let no, uh, you know, let no uh, un, uh, dirty word, rotten word. I think that's, the word there in the original is, has to do kind of with rotten fruit or trash that's been thrown out, that it's, it's rotten, it's bad. Okay, Sin, and, and he's translating that over into the idea of sinfulness, corrupt. Okay, but all are kind of the same family there. We don't want to have something that comes out of our mouth that is rotten. It smells bad, it's dirty, it's foul, it's filthy. And it's so easy. Again, we're surrounded by it. This is just the air we breathe, the words that come out of people's mouths. And you could dig deep into that. But he says, what ought to come out of your mouth, he doesn't just say, hey, clean it up. Clean it up, son. No, that's not what he's saying. Any, anybody can work on cleaning it up. Now, I work with people who had no interest in Jesus, and they're... they're, they're Words were clean. No, he's saying what we want to do is, instead of having these unwholesome or rotten words that come out of our mouth, we want only words to come out that are good for building others up according to the specific need of our speaking so that it might give grace to them. It will benefit them. And again, there's, there's a great joy in this. When you think about the fact that the power of your words and the effect that they can have on people. I, I know in our G2 group, um, uh, um, in our G2 group, um, Jack Belland has, he has a job, and he's had jobs where he has a cost to interact with people a lot. And one of the things I know he, he says to people oftentimes is, your life matters. Just that simple phrase, your life matters. And this has made a huge difference for many people, just to hear that from somebody, to understand their life matters. Uh, he was telling a story one time about somebody who had remembered, you know, they remembered him. They had cause to see him years later, and they remembered him and said, hey, you, you, know, you told me my life mattered, and that made an impact on me. And there are many other words that we speak, and they have an impact on people. We know the, the negative impact our words can have on people. If we say things to them that tear them down, those can last a lifetime, and they do. Right? We remember things our parents say to us or other people say to us. Well, we want to do that on the positive side of things. Use our words in ways that build people up, that give them grace, that benefit them according to their need. And we ought to strategize about that and think about, what can I say here? What can I say to coworkers? What can I say to spouse? What can I say to children, family members that will give grace to them, that will benefit them and build them up. We're not trying to pump sunshine, you know, blow snow. We're trying to say things that will actually build them up. Again, more could be said. Uh, but let's look at verses uh, 30, 30 and 31 here. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit of God? Well, we grieve him by, if it's connected to the words that we use, surely words that tear people down or that are false, that, that convey falsehood, that aren't true. When we engage in these kind of things, we will grieve the Holy Spirit because our hope and our faith will not be in God. We will not be trusting in what he says. We will not be looking, as it says there, to the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit indwells us believers. The Holy Spirit seals us for that day, and therefore we ought to live looking toward that day, encouraging people toward that day, speaking the truth people so that their mind is fixed on that, building them up in that. And when we don't do that, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Verse 31, I mean, it can't be more plain here. I mean, Paul uses five adjectives, five words here, right? Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, malice. It must have been important. It's still important. Just think about the world in which we live. 
Think about how much around us and the words that people use, the way they talk to each other, the way our public discourse, discourse in families and things, how much of it is based on bitterness. Children bitter towards parents, siblings bitter toward one another. They don't speak to each other because something that happened 40 years ago and they're still bitter about it. Jesus wants us to be free of all this. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, not slandering other people. How easy it is to just slander them. I'm guilty of this all the time. We, 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 it's so easy to just put people down, tear them down. It feels so good at first. But Paul says, put that away. Malice, put that away from you. Rather, in contrast, be kind to one another. Be tenderhearted. Be forgiving. Because God in Christ has forgiven you. You ought to live the same way. You ought to be the same way. Gentle, humble. These are the kind of people we want to be. Uh, and, and so, as a final word on this, just a practical word, um, I want to say again, we don't do this in our own power. We don't do this as moralists, just trying to clean up our act. We do it by putting on the new man, becoming what we are. We are new creatures in Christ. We are made alive in him. We have the power of the resurrection of the Holy Spirit within us. And by that power, we want to obey these commands. And there's great joy in doing so. But we have to practice. And some of this, I think, we, we practice by the grace of God by using practical spiritual disciplines. We need to practice things like solitude and silence, not speaking sometimes. And sometimes we're, we're tempted to say so much that when we get in the moment where we need to say a good word for edification, we're not able to say that. We say something that tears people down. So sometimes we need to practice away from those situations just being silent. Just maybe fasting, depriving ourselves, denying ourselves so that we are able to overcome temptations to be angry when the moment arises. Right? I mean, I'm not angry right now. Most of us would walk around saying, yeah, I don't think I'm an angry person. That's not the problem. The problem is that in the right circumstances, that anger that's there, that's still deep down in us there, okay, that hasn't been rooted out by our sanctification yet, that anger then comes out. And then we think about it, and we feel badly, and we go, my gosh, look at the damage I did by having that angry outburst. I mean, I can think of examples, you know, my children, I go, I was angry, and it, it hurts me. I'm hurt by it. I know the damage it can do. But part of the reason that came out is because I wasn't practiced or disciplined so that in that moment, I was ready to respond without anger. And so that's something I think we have to do practically speaking. And again, Dallas Willard talks a lot about this with the spiritual disciplines of Practicing secrecy, doing good deeds in secret, okay? having quiet, having silence, having solitude, fasting, praying, reading the scriptures, meditating, meditation, so that we are filled with all the fullness of God. And then we're able to respond in these situations. We're able to speak a word that builds people up. We're able to speak the truth and, and stay away from falsehood. We're able to put away bitterness and wrath and anger and slander. So that's just a practical word, I think, is we're all encouraging each other in this to become one in Christ, to have this unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, and to live in these ways. And this is how we walk. This is what it means to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, to be different people so that we have the gospel, the salvation of Christ, to recommend to an unbelieving world. Let's pray. God, thank you for this word. Give us continued grace to walk worthy of you, to practice these things, to be these kind of people who speak the truth, who stay away from falsehood, who are not tossed here and there by false doctrine, but know the truth and teach it and talk it to each other, who put away from us anger and wrath and malice and slander, and we use our words, Lord, help us to use our words, which are so powerful, to build people up, to benefit them. May we have joy in this. May we be eager. May you work in our inner being to say, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want my life to have impact. I want my life to matter 
for other people. I want to point people to you and build them up in you, Lord. Help us to have that mindset. Help us to practice in the things we need to do so that when the need arises, we will act out of the character of Christ. Help us to be tenderhearted. Help us to be gentle and humble, forgiving of one another, because you have forgiven us, Lord. Thank you for these words, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.